Well, hello and welcome to Bethel Online. Want to give a big shout out to our San Jose and Santa Clara campuses. Thanks for tuning in today. Uh, depending on when you're tuning in, uh, we're either just getting ready for drive-in church at San Jose and Santa Clara, or we're just wrapping up drive-in at San Jose and Santa Clara. At any rate, I'm just so glad that you have tuned in today. Um, I read an article uh, recently that was titled this way, uh, 11 things socially aware people don't say socially aware people don't say. I wrote down just a few of them. See if you recognize any of them. I told you so. Uh, it's all in your head. That's always helpful, right? Uh, I know how you feel. That can be bothersome, right? Uh, good luck with that. Uh, that was stupid. Uh, I, as I said before, and I thought, oh man, I read that. I'm guilty of that. I've done that, as I've said before, uh, and then uh, finally, whatever, whatever. Well, I read that article and I thought, you know, there are hundreds of ways, if you think about it, there are hundreds of ways to communicate to another person that they're not valuable. It's, there's lots of ways to do that. Uh, lots of ways to say, you know what, you really don't count. Like your life really doesn't count. Your opinion really doesn't count. And sometimes we do it and we don't even realize that we're doing it. And we've all been on the giving and receiving end of that. Well, we continue in our teaching series, Values That Build Vision. And, and what you and I really value, what we actually value, not what we say we value, but what we actually value, uh, it's going to inform and impact everything else in our lives. It's going to inform and impact everything else. And as we continue to learn how to navigate in the deep end of life, I kicked off this series talking about the deep end. We are in the deep end. Remember, the deep end represents a place of risk. The deep end represents the place of the unknowns, things that are uncertain or uncomfortable or just plain hard. And that's where we're at right now in our country and in our world. It's just plain hard. And I, and, and I reminded us that these values are so important that we're unpacking in this series because they will anchor us in the deep end. Uh, they will help us navigate and stay on mission in the middle of the deep end of life. And Pastor George kicked us off, did a great job, talked about Jesus at the center. Last Sunday, by the way, these five values make an acronym. It's real easy, J-E-S-U-S. -S. And uh, so it's real easy to remember them that way. But he talked about how important it is to actually understand who Jesus is and what he's actually done for us, okay? And the more that we understand who he is and what he's done, the more we will not only invite him in to be the leader and the forgiver of our life, but we'll invite him into everything. We'll invite him into the sorrows and the successes of life, to the ups and downs of life. We'll invite him into everything. We'll invite him into our marriage and into our business and, and into our checkbook and all of those things. We'll just invite him in the better we understand who he is and what he's done. Well, today we look at the second value, the E in Jesus. Every person counts. Every person counts. And if you have your Bible or you have it on smart device today, you can turn to Luke chapter 10. And in Luke chapter 10, there's a real familiar scene if you've been in church any length of time. And the scene goes this way. There's a religious law expert that uh, asks Jesus a question. And he says, hey, teacher, how does someone or how shall I inherit eternal life? And Jesus answers with a question. He did that a lot. And he says, well, what's written in, what's written in God's law? What, what, is it, what does it say? You're the law expert, right? And so the guy responds. And in the, Luke, the historian and the ancient physician, he writes down the following in chapter 10 and verse 27. And the guy answered this way, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. Well, he's drawn off to Old Testament old law passages, right? Deuteronomy 6, the Shema. Uh, Jewish kids learned that and grew up with it. Well, you know, love the Lord your God. And then also he pulls from Leviticus chapter 19. Make sure you love your neighbor as yourself. Jesus says, you're right. Good answer. Do that and you'll live. But the law expert, Luke tells us, wanted to justify himself. 
In other words, he wanted to pick and choose who his neighbor really is. Uh, he wanted it to be, uh, I'm going to choose you, but I'm not going to choose you kind, kind of a thing. Uh, don't, don't we all want to pick our neighbor? Don't we all? I mean, it just makes, let's be real, it just makes life easier. It makes my life easier, your life easier, if I just get to pick and choose who my neighbor is. If I get to pick and choose who, who I'm going to love. Listen, that law expert, it was drilled into his life since he was a kid. His whole life that his neighbor was people just like him. It was the Jewish people. That's your neighbor. That's who you love. So he says, hey, teacher, who's my neighbor? Jesus answers with a story to illustrate it. It's a parable, right? Parables reflect something about what, how God views life, what God values in life. So he tells this story. There was a man who left Jerusalem, no doubt a Jewish man. He's coming from the holy city and he's going down to Jericho. Uh, it's a long road. It's a dangerous road. And he's jumped, Jesus says. Jesus is telling the story. And he's beaten and he's left for dead. And a priest who would have been the hero in the crowd, right? The priest comes by, but he passes the man by. And then a Levite, these were caretakers in the temple. The Levite, they were the ones that said, safety first, safety first. He comes by, sees this guy, is he dead, is he alive? I don't know, he's beaten up. But he crosses the other side and he just keeps going. Jesus in his story then, and then there was a Samaritan. I promise you, the whole group says, okay, here's the villain in the story. The, the Samaritan is the villain in the story. The, I'm sure they were convinced of that. Samaritans were a different race from a different country. Jews would have called them half-breeds. They hated each other for centuries. Well, if you know the story, it's the Samaritan who stops, the, takes care of the guy in the road, puts him on his donkey, takes him to an inn, pays the innkeeper, bandages his wounds. I mean, he just meets the guy's needs, especially immediate needs, tells the innkeeper, I got to go, I'll be back. If there's anything else that he needs, charge it to my account. And this part of Jesus' story is truly shocking to his audience. It's shocking, shocking. And then Jesus turns and asks the law expert after telling this story, Luke chapter 10, verses 36 and 37. Let's look at these verses together. Which of these three do you think was a neighbor? Now, don't miss this language. Which of these three do you think was a neighbor, was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of robbers? And the expert in the law replied, the one who had mercy on him. He couldn't bring himself to say the Samaritan in your story, couldn't do it. The one who had mercy on him. And Jesus told him, go and do likewise. At first glance, the message of the story is really quite clear. Your neighbor is anyone in need. And that is true, but it's incomplete. What Jesus does in this story, he flips the entire question around from who is my neighbor to a command, go be that neighbor. Go be that neighbor. This is how people who choose to love God with their heart, soul, strength, and mind behave. This is, this is what they do. And this is good news for us today because if God's love could overcome centuries of hate and prejudice between Samaritan, a Samaritan and a Jew, he can change you and me. He can change our country. He can change our world. This story is a powerful picture of the second core value. Every person counts. How do we build this value, right, into our lives? Like, how do we do it? I want you to imagine for a moment Christians everywhere, all over the world. Christians, I mean, what, what two and a half billion? Uh, Christians ev everywhere in the middle of angry and divisive 
uh, and, and culture today, in the middle of incredible conflict today. Imagine Christians everywhere being that kind of neighbor actually being that kind of neighbor. A neighbor, in nation, a neighbor in their neighborhood and a neighbor in nations. Just imagine that for a moment. How can we be that neighbor? I want to leave you with two, two takeaways today. We're going to unpack them a little bit. Two takeaways today. These are things we can all do and it will help us make every person count. The first one is, number one, remember what Jesus has done for you. Remember what Jesus has done for you. So let me ask you a question today, and I'd like you to go in the chat and talk about it a little bit. The question is this, what do you think is the worst evil in this world? That's kind of an interesting question. What do you think is the worst evil in this world? What do you, like, what do you think it is? Go to the chat, put a, put a word or phrase there, and some of you might want to talk about it a little bit. It's a great opportunity to have a little bit of discussion, even after today's teaching. Uh, you, you, could do, you could do that in our, in our, in our uh, Zoom lobby at the end of this, at the end of this uh, worship gathering. But what do you think is the worst, the worst evil in our world? According to the scriptures, it's not what you might think. It's not war. It's not famine, as horrible as those are. It's not injustice and racism, as terrible as those things are. It's not abuse or pornography or hate or indifference. All those things are awful. Hear me. The greatest evil in our world is far more sinister and devious than those things. The greatest evil in our world is pride. Pride. Pride is the view that I am more than you, that I am above you, that I am better than you. Wow. Name the most horrendous acts in history. You will trace them all back to pride. You will trace them all back to this idea of pride. Pride is the evil that fuels every other evil in this world. And guess what? We all have to battle it because sometimes it isn't overt. Sometimes it's not ugly and evil. Sometimes it's something that rolls around inside of us. I mean, it was C.S. Lewis who said it. He was absolutely right. He said, if a man or a woman thinks he is not conceited, he is very conceited indeed. It's the truth. <laughs> it's the truth, right? If we don't recognize it in us, we're really in trouble. The moment that I think or I behave that I am better than, that I'm above, that I'm above, all manner of evil will follow. It will begin to follow in my life. It's true in your marriage. It's true at work. It's true in our, it's true in our neighborhoods. It's true when it comes to our relationship with God. And we see this play out. Unfortunately, we see it play out in the church sometimes. People pick and choose. Uh, but we see it in our culture. We see it all the time in our culture. I mean, it's on display every day. I share, for example, I share the passion of some who want to right the wrongs of injustice and racism. I do. Uh, those are biblical values, to want to right those wrongs. But if I'm not careful, I can approach it from a posture of pride, not humility. I can actually approach the project right? Approach the goal from a posture of pride. And sooner or later, I end up becoming the very things that I said I stand against. We see this every day in our culture. Those who pick and choose who deserves love and who doesn't. We see it every single day. This is where the religious law expert was at. He wanted to pick and choose those who deserve to be loved and valued and those who didn't. I encourage you to post this. It's in your outline today, and there is an outline. There's notes uh, if you're online, and hopefully there's a link if you're, uh, if you're on Facebook uh, or YouTube where you can click on that link and, and uh, pull up these notes. But I have this in your outline today, in your notes. It's easy to call out the sins of others, but we must first call out our own. We must first call out our own. When Jesus began the greatest sermon on record that we have, the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapter 5, 6, and 7, he summarized everything that he would say in those three chapters in eight succinct statements. We call them the Beatitudes. The Beatitudes are a summary of everything else he talks about in 
uh, the Sermon on the Mount. And it start, they all start with, blessed are you when? Blessed are you when? They build on each other. The first beatitude is foundational to the other seven. The first beatitude reads this way, Matthew chapter 5 and verse 3. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Uh, Eugene Peterson in his message translation says, you are blessed when you're at the end of your rope. I want you to think about that. What does it mean to be blessed that way? What does it mean to be blessed because of my spiritual poverty? Because I am poor in spirit. Why is that a blessed life? Because blessed are those who see their need. Because that's exactly what it means. Blessed are those who see their need. Who see their need for a savior. Oswald Chambers nailed it. He said it over a hundred years ago, the knowledge of our own poverty is what brings us to a proper place where Jesus Christ accomplishes his work. We can't get there any other way. We've got to start here. Blessed are those who see their need. Let's remember it took the death of the Son of God to remedy your need and my need. I need forgiveness. I need a savior. I need hope. I need the promise of heaven. Spiritual poverty in ours, Jesus took care of it, but it took his death to do so. And the great apostle Paul, and you see this throughout the, the New Testament, you see in the Old Testament as well. And Isaiah said, our righteousness is as fi filthy rags. But Paul said in Romans 3 and verse 23, all have sinned, all have missed the mark, all. All have sinned and fall short of God's glorious standard. But he doesn't stop there. He goes into verse 24. Uh, Romans chapter 3, verse 24. Let's look at it. And all are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. All are justified. All fail, all fall short, and all can be justified. It's a forensic term. It's a legal term. Picture a ledger, and I got red ink in my ledger. The, everybody has red ink in their ledger of life. And Jesus came and wipes the red, the, the red ink out of my life when I accept him into my life. This is exactly what this is talking about. This is really good news, really good news. I can be forgiven. I can have a purpose for living. I can have a promised home in heaven. All of this is true because of what Jesus has done. Pastor George, last week, he, uh, he shared, he said, look at one of the things Jesus came to do was to rescue us to rescue us from our sin, to rescue us from ourselves. Sometimes we're our own worst enemy. Why did Jesus come to rescue us? Because we needed rescuing. Because the world needs rescuing. It doesn't matter where you're born. It doesn't matter um, what your bank account is. It doesn't matter what kind of education you have, what your gender is, what your race is. It doesn't matter the titles that you hold. We all need rescuing. And it was his love that provided the way for people to be rescued. And listen, he did it for you and he did it for me before we ever did anything right. And he did it for all who will call on his name. A prayer that I pray almost every day almost every day goes like this. Father, you owe me nothing. I owe you everything. Yet you have given me everything. You owe me nothing. I owe you everything. Yet you have given me everything. I would encourage you to post this today. Again, it's in your outline. Never lose the wonder of God's outrageous love demonstrated through the death and the resurrection of Jesus. This value of every person counts starts with seeing my own need. It starts with seeing my own need. And what this does, my own need for mercy, my own need for forgiveness. And what this does is it fosters in us a posture of humility, not pride. Hey, we can make the hard calls. We can take the hard stands. We can do all of that, but we do it from a posture of humility. I'm in the same boat. Without Jesus, I'm in the same boat as every bun, everyone 
else. Number two, restore what is broken in others. We remember our own need. We remember what Jesus has done for us, but then we restore what is broken in others. Read a great story uh, about former baseball manager Clint Hurdle. If you guys are baseball fans, you probably know him. Back in 2009, uh, he started writing notes of encouragement to about a dozen uh, colleagues uh, when he was managing the Colorado Rockies. And he would write them a note of support or maybe a leadership tip or he would share a quote or sometimes he would do these weekly resolutions like for example one he wrote, offer loving kindness to my inner critic. I thought that was pretty clever. Offer loving kindness to my inner uh, critic. Uh, two years after he led the Rockies to a World Series, of course, the, uh, I think it was the, um, Red, uh, the Red Sox swept them. But uh, two years after they went to the World Series, he was fired. He's on a spring vacation, which is super rare. And a, Rocky, a Colorado Rocky staff member calls and says, man, where are you? We're not seeing any notes. You're not writing to us. I mean, they really, really got after him and said, look, it, we, we, we need to hear from you. You're the one that always wants to make a difference in somebody's life. You're not making a difference in our life right now. And so his wife said, well, Clint, what do you think you should do about this? And he decided to pick back up and start writing his notes again. Today, that list, okay, it was a dozen. Today, it mark, it, 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 it's numbered over 5,000 people. The thing has literally exploded over the last 10 years. You can go to his website and you can actually subscribe to clinthurdle.com and you'll receive uh, those messages and those encouragements that he writes. See, what Clint Hurdle discovered is that encouraging words are healing words, especially in hard times, especially in hard times. Jesus' story of the Good Samaritan it taught the law expert, it taught the crowd, and it, talked, and, it, and it taught us that being a neighbor is all about healing and restoring, right? That's what this Good Samaritan did. It's all about healing and restoring the broken places. Clint, Clint uh, Hurdle discovered what King Solomon wrote 3,000 years ago in Proverbs chapter 12 and verse 25. This is the way it reads. Anxiety weighs down the heart. We have hearts everywhere that are weighed down in our society. But a kind word cheers them up. Every person counts means we enter into the joys and the needs of other people. We do what we can with what we have to restore what is broken. Listen, we can't do everything, but everyone can do something. And I want to leave you with two practical ways to do this. Two practical ways, okay? The letter A, and this is in your outline, meet needs with love. Meet needs with love. The Good Samaritan did what he could with what he had. He didn't do everything, okay? He didn't stay for days upon days with this man who was wounded and, 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 and healing. He had other things to do, but he did care enough to do something for those immediate needs that day. And not only that, he enlisted others in the process. He enlisted the innkeeper. We can all do this. We can all meet needs with love. It may just be encouraging words like, like Clint, Clint Hurdle. And I say just encouraging words. How many of you know that, that, that encouragement is in huge demand today because we have so little of it? I mean, if you're an encouraging person, which is a biblical idea that impacts people's lives, if you're an encouragement to other people, man, you're going to make a difference. It may be something more than that. It may be something more than words. It may be something sacrificial because sometimes God calls us to sacrifice for the sake of others. This is so important, so important. Don't become distracted by the noise in our culture. I've said this a few times. Don't become distracted by the noise in our culture. Stay focused on the people that God has in your life and that God brings across your path. Stay focused on them. Stay focused. Meet needs with love. Letter B, make peace wherever possible. Make peace, make peace wherever possible. I love this. In the story that Jesus told the Good Samaritan, this man is beaten, he is left for dead. The Samaritan was part of the solution. Don't miss that. 
Don't miss that. The Samaritan was part of the solution. He brought God's peace, God's shalom, God's shalom to this man. God, peace is more than the absence of conflict. It's introducing God's order into a situation. It's bringing the order of God, the blessing of God into a situation. Jesus said in those same Beatitudes in Matthew 5 and verse 9, blessed are the peacemakers for they will be called the children of God. Blessed are the peacemakers. Again, uh, Eugene Peterson's The Message. Uh, it says you are blessed when you can show people how to cooperate instead of compete or fight. I want you to imagine with me for just a moment that you're part of a large crowd and people are all listening to the teacher. When all of a sudden there was a group, a small group of religious proud power brokers that are literally dragging a woman in front of everyone in that crowd and they call her sin out publicly. Publicly, they shame her. This woman was caught in the act of adultery. That's what they say. Now, last time I checked, it took two people to commit that act, but we don't know where the guy is. But here's the gal, and they call out her sin. And then they say to Jesus, the law of Moses says, stone her, what do you say? Jesus, what do you say? And in John's Gospel account, chapter 8, it says that Jesus knelt down and he began to just write in the sand. Oh, wouldn't you want to know what he was writing in the sand? I would. We don't know. They continue to hound him while he writes in the sand. Hey, teacher, what do you say? Moses lost his stoner. What do you say? And Jesus finally stands up and he answers them. Let the one without sin. Let the one, let the one who has never been wrong and who has never done wrong throw the first stone. John says he knelt down again and he began to write in the sand. And then the next scene was that one by one, from the oldest to the youngest, they began to drop their rocks. I'm sure you could hear the thud, 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 thud. Jesus turns to the woman who has been thoroughly shamed. Where are your accusers? Has anyone condemned you? None. None. Neither do I condemn you. Now go and leave your life of sin. Go and live a forgiven and free life. That's what Jesus told her. It is a powerful picture of peacemaking. It's bringing God's order, God's shalom into the life of another. It's helping people learn how to drop their stones. Drop the rocks. Listen, we all live in this crazy broken world together. I wish, I wish our culture could get a hold of this. We all live in this crazy and broken world together. The better we get at dropping our stones and offering grace, is the better our, the better our world will become. We've gotta learn how to just drop the stones. Every person counts, every person counts. Living out this value means that we need to remember our own need, what Jesus has actually done for us. We deserve judgment. God offers mercy through his son. He offers grace through his son. And then we restore what is broken. We restore what is broken in others. And we, and we a couple of easy, meet needs with love. We, whatever those needs, small and large are like, meet needs with love. Make peace wherever you can. Jesus was the only one who was qualified to throw the stone at this, at this lady. 
and he gave her grace. Listen, grace doesn't make excuses. Grace doesn't excuse wrong behavior. It does not. Grace is powerful. It's not wimpy, it's powerful. It doesn't excuse wrong behavior. It just gives an opportunity to change. An opportunity to change. Would you pray with me today? Jesus, thank you for your grace. Thank you for this story today. Chances are all of us find ourselves somewhere in this story. And I pray in this moment that we would take these simple principles that you taught and we would begin to, we would begin to build them into our lives. We need to remember what you have done for us, man. If we are already following you, we already have a relationship with you. What you have done, we would be lost forever without you. We owe you everything. Help us. Help us, God, to begin to restore the broken places in people's lives. And we can all meet needs with love. We can all, we can all make peace. We can all introduce your shalom into situations. We can do that today. And I pray that you'll help us do that. And maybe you're here right now. Maybe you've never received Jesus into your life. You know, you hear about his teaching. You hear about this peace. You hear about this story. And you kind of go, I, like, I want to follow someone like that. I know that's what I think. Like, who wouldn't want to follow Jesus with their whole life? Who wouldn't want to follow him with their whole life? And I would just invite you in. I would invite you to invite him in, rather. Just invite him in, as best as you know how. Maybe your heart's grown cold today. Just pray, Jesus, I come to you just as I am. Forgive me for living my life apart from you. Forgive me. Come into my life. Be the forgiver. Be the healer. Be the restorer of my life. And help me to go and do the same things you did. Every person counts. If you prayed that prayer, let us know today. Let us know at Bethel, um, or hello at Bethel.org. Hello at Bethel.org. We'd love to connect with you. We'd love to invite folks to the, to the Zoom lobby for just a few moments, and we can hang out, and maybe we can talk about some of the stuff that we just walked through today. I encourage you to do that. I encourage you to invite. I encourage you to extend the invitations to others. Thanks so much for tuning in, tuning in today, and God bless you.